हाँ डॉक्टर संबित हेलो 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 या डॉक्टर संबित कनी हुई हमी हेलो 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 हाय गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग हाउ आर यू गुड गुड हाउ आर यू डूइंग आई एम फाइन योर वॉइस इज अ बिट लो द वॉल्यूम इज हैज टू बी अप अ बिट स्लाइटली लेट मी जस्ट चेक दैट नो इट्स 100% द वॉल्यूम इज 100% Yeah, fine, great. Can you can you have your video? Long? No, it's fine. You just have your video on. Okay. You mean my uh, camera? Yeah, your camera. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So all set. Should we start? Yeah, I think we should start. Okay, your camera is still not on, is it? Yeah, I think it's on now. I'm like sitting on the floor, so I deliberately. Okay, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You can keep it off. No issues. Okay. No, but it's fine. As, uh, as yeah. you are comfortable, no issues. Okay. Okay, so we start, right? Sure, sure. Right. Great. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue, and this is Pursue Two H. which is lymph nodal pathology we are streaming live from amri bhubaneswar via kolkata today we have a very interesting talk and a very accomplished pathologist to address the topic the topic is lymph node for general surgical pathologist something which we all really call molecular digital, digital pathologist he received the record number of distinction and 12 university gold medals in his mbbs from s C B M C H Odisha did a residency from PGI Chandigarh and then from the State University of New York. The clinical fellowship training in oncology and surgical women health urologic digital and molecular pathologies, with more than over hundred publications, multiple chapters and books, and a number of invited presentation in ASCO US CAP, AD ASDP CAP and ASCP to his credit. He is also the reviewer of board of a number of international acclaimed pathology and oncological journals. His research interests are primarily on genetic and neuroendocrine breast cancers, molecular profiling of genitourinary and gynecological malignancies, and lymphoma. Currently, he is the director of the oncological, surgical, and molecular pathology at the famous AMRI Hospital, Bhubaneswar. With this, let me before I ask Dr. Mohanty to take over, let me request you to keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, let me ask Dr. Mohanty sir, please share your screen and let us start. just press present now and your yeah. entire screen and press in the center and share is my screen yeah. visible i can see your screen please make it full screen please Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and just press uh, that hide thing so that that pop up just goes away. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So right. good evening, guys, and good evening, everyone who is in the uh, who is kind of listening to me. And thank you, Nadinda, for this excellent uh, kind of introduction about me, which I probably doesn't deserve. Anyway, so thank you. And lymphoma is one area. I am. probably the most weak in uh, out of breast gu gyn and all and molecular pathology lymphoma i know the list so i thought let's attempt to cover lymphoma whatever i know in a single class uh, so these are the people with whom i work so um, at different centers 
So I kind of dedicate and acknowledge them for this presentation. All of them, they helped in giving their cases. I basically what I do, they are all lymphoma people. I help them sometimes whenever there is some difficulty or there is a rewarding issue and how to go about it as purely as a general surgical pathologist. So let's start with a few cases. Uh, the first case is a like a 15 year kid uh, with fever, weight loss and night sweat with multiple cervical lymph nodes. The bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy and uh, peripheral blood findings are normal. ESA was mildly increased. LDH wasn't done in the beginning. But the history was like <coughs> fever, night sweat and weight loss with bilateral cervical lymph node. The largest one is about 2.5 centimeter. So what we have on h &E, this I borrowed from Manas. I mean, I was involved with him, but he was a primary pathologist. There was complete assessment of the nodal architecture. It was completely gone. Uh, there was no residual follicles. And instead, we have a very diffuse pattern of polymorphic in involvement. What I mean by polymorphic, what I see, you have these big cells, which are kind of standing out, even in the lowest power. This is uh, a medium power picture. And we have other cells making the majority of the lymph node. The major 90% of the cells are the cells which are in the background. And these big cells are popping up. Some are binucleated, some are uninucleated, some having this irregularity of the nuclear envelope. Uh, the chromatin is coarse. Some prominent nucleolus in some of these. This is the binucleate and some eosinophilic cytoplasm. And if you see, you have a typical cell with prominent nucleolus, eosinophilic and perinucleolar clearing, cytoplasm, this is another one, this is another one, and this one, it looks like as if the nucleolus is gone with some chromocenters. So, I mean, I would not jump to a diagnosis of Hodgkin looking at this. You, I can show you a Ritz-Sternberg cell and its variants in virtually any medicine. So looking at these cells, for everyone, all of you in the group, and particularly for the trainees, the residents and the fellows, do not jump into a diagnosis of Hodgkin when you look at this kind of cell. You say like it's a classical Hodgkin cell, and that was when we are in the training. The differential alleys and people are not aware of all these entities, and the discovery was still going on way back in 1995-96. So I thought it's a polymorphic infiltrate, and I have these big cells, and the cells in the background, they're plasma cell, lymphocytes, some endothelial cells, some eosinophils, and some histiocytes. So what I did, when I get this kind of thing, uh, I try to like my first panel. I'll go in a panel approach. And this is another area where it has a cord-like arrangement. The cells, which are... Bist um, I would not say bystander right away because they may not be bystander. I haven't done an immuno yet. These are the inflammatory cells in the background, uh, plasma cells, follicular center cells, and all those, and histiocytes. They are forming cord like arrangements and clustering. And you have some multinucleated cells as well, and some uninucleated with two nucleolus, multiple nucleolus. So, all sorts of aberrations were there. So, I'll show you another case with a similar kind of history. That was a 15-year-old male, and this is. So in that case, uh, it was not difficult. So I did a 45 uh, LCA and a PAX-5 to begin with. So my 45 was dead negative in those big cells. And the background cells are 45 positive. The B cells in the background are strongly PAX-5 positive, whereas this large cells, they're so weak and barely perceptible, very wishy-washy kind of PAX-5 positive, which are weak. Uh, so that basically helped me. So those are cells with aberrant, follicular, um, or post-germinal center differentiation. So they are not expressing 45, and they're PAX-5 dim. They're negative for 20. The background cells are 3 positive, big cells are 3 negative, ALK and a plastic plus a lymphoma kinase, which was negative. And those cells are 15 and 30 positive. CD15 and CD30 has Golgi zone perinuclear dot-like positivity. So that confirmed my diagnosis, the classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Do not use the word Hodgkin's. It is Hodgkin lymphoma. 
and there's no apostrophe s so that is something too and we are not using the word hodgkin disease now it's saying hodgkin lymphoma so it was a 1530 positive 23 negative alk negative 45 negative and pax 5 team ebv lmp positive classical hodgkin so what's the big deal why i'm showing this case let's go to the next case in a similar theme is a 50 year old man with intermittent fevers and night sweat with a chronic cough a pet city a uh, sort of enlarged left supraclavicular lymph node and there was another lesion in the left lobe of the liver with multiple bulky retroperitoneal lymph nodes peripheral blood smear were normal the except for anemia which was again not mostly normal chronic no blast no abnormal cell uh, so they went ahead and did an excision of the left supraclavicular lymph node in this lymph node This is not a capsule. This is a trap, fibrous tissue, which is present, and this is dividing for the multiple nodules, and multiple nodules, and the varying size nodules. The nodule has a dark peri, the varying size nodules. The nodule has a dark periphery and a pale center. And this is again, this is the paler nodule. You see, there's big cells from this part as well, and some small cells. This is more mottled. what i mean by mottled they have a uh, sets of white and blue a pink and blue um and this is like a blue area and again we have broad bands of fibrosis which is kind of dissecting out the lymph node into multiple nodules and further dividing the nodules into different small nodules this large cells some having hypochromatic nucleus and this lymphoid tissue So this is a no brainer again the same thing we have what's the big deal so we have a lot of these cells as compared to the last case here the number of this union nucleated binucleated and multinucleated ugly looking bigger cells are a lot and we have some lymphocytes what is important when i'm kind of looking at that lymph node it was an old case i saw some of these follicles like this one is one and sorry for this scoring mark and there is another one there's a fold there and, and there is another one and this is the nodule with those large cell and polymorphic background so when i look at this this is something like this where the concentric kind of a little pale tiny center same thing here same thing here so what's going on i was like more curious about this area forgetting about this area so let's see what's happening this is at a hyper if you see this is concentric this is the marginal zone the mantle is the follicular center the mantle is always dark to remember for for the neophytes in pathology mantle is the dark concentric area of cells marginal zones they do have clear or eosinophilic cytoplasm they are polyhedral to polygonal they are about two times the size of mantle cells and follicular cells are again bigger they into So the periphery is the marginal zone is pale. Excuse me. Hello. Hello, please, uh, uh, I am actually in the middle of a class. Can I talk to you later? Sure. So, um, so in the periphery we have. Sorry. So in the periphery we have this bigger cells and. center but look at this center which kind of and if you see this center is pale and there are some paler cells which are kind of getting into this area and this is very tightly packed i i was not very comfortable uh, kind of naming it as a reactive or a residual follicle so i don't know somehow my brain was stuck again if we go to for the high power these are the follicular center cells with some nucleolus These are the two nucleus, and if you see, if these cells are kind of travers traversing, they're going in between. They're going in between towards the marginal zone or the mantle, but this follicle sort of is not looking healthy to me. So opinion. So can I have some opinion? Other than the Hodgkin, I think that one is the Hodgkin probably, but we'll talk about it. I do not know yet. So any opinion from the house, from the audience? Let's wait and see.
Cas can it be castle man just? Mm, that's a very good thought, castle man. But I had only three follicles, and to be very honest with you, is it pull kit? Yes, yes, pull kit here. Yeah. Hi, hi, pull kit. So uh, uh, there was only one follicle like that, and the other two I was kind of more extrapolating. But when I went to high power, I did not see that. And the follicular center, as you said, was not exactly atrophic. I did not find any vessel getting into it, but that's definitely a good thought. And uh, do you want to do any stem? to kind of know what is the nature of that polyp but that's definitely a great thought will you be want to do any stand to kind of chase after that polyp yeah at least uh, 320 bcl2 and cd30 okay those are would be done so bcl2 definitely you are going to you will do but in a classical hodgkin lymphoma with this kind of histology we do go for a bcl2 if mm -hmm. you are 13 15 and 45 perhaps by they are all behaving in the right way would you go for a b or do not go for a bcl2 but with this kind of thing i'll probably go for a bcl2 yeah definitely for this follicle yes great 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 so this is my 20 20 was highlighting quite a few cells in this um, the big cells and small cells these are basically i took this picture from the Large cell areas. This is my three. Three was staining some of the cells, not up to the tune of twenty, but maximally these cells are positive for thirty, then fifteen, then twenty, then three, and some three positivity were called zone kind of positivity. And this is the thirty, which is again beautiful dot. And this is my fifteen. This is Pax five, which has a heterogeneous kind of staining some which is kind of completely washed up some intermediate some dark maybe the regular by standard b cells and some having intermediate kind of staining okay this is my mum one this is oct two bob ema and ibar ish were negative I did uh, some T cell antigens here, like four, five, two, seven, and eight, and they showed some sort of positivity, a variable degree range of positivity in those big cells. Twenty. I just showed you. Uh, let's uh, I'm, now. I'm focusing on those follicular areas, those three follicles. Um, mainly, I'm focusing on this one. The twenty positive. Three there. Uh, Few three positive cells in the center, but majority are negative. Ten was positive, and BCL two was high. Not this one. This two. Okay. This one. This two. Hello. Hello.
There is some link problem at Dr. Sambit Mahanti's end. I'm just waiting for him to rejoin.
Hello. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, I think I lost my connection. I'm so sorry for that. And yeah, uh, I think which slide, you, which, which slide was it? You go to the complex slide pattern which you were showing, 4 in 1. The IHC? Yeah, the IHC ones, yeah. Just go, go ahead, go, go more further up. Yeah, yeah, this, this one. one. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry, you guys. Like you uh, just press the right so that yeah, yeah. sure. So uh, the okay. T cells they're positive for T cell antigen except for CD7. They're positive for five, four, uh, two, and eight, and they're positive for three as well. And changing after that nodule or the follicle, the type, uh, um, the follicle with that concentric thing, is for express BCL2 in the center, they're positive for 10 and 20. And the negative stands when the large cells for LCA, ALK, PD1, 7, beta F1, TIA, granozyme, and pancytokeratin. So IHC wise, the large cell immunoprofile was compatible with the classical Hodgkin. And some of the large cells express T cell antigen except for CD7. And it is kind of well documented uh, the positivity for T cell antigen in Hodgkin and the small, uh, the follicles, the sort of features of in situ follicular lymphoma, which are confirmed by fish acid. Close cytometry, so a small population of kappa restricted cells that are positive for 20, 19, 10, and BCL2, and they're negative for CD5. So I will not be wasting my time going much into the flow details. I'll just quickly show you the 19 and 10 positive, 5 negative cells, and the cap are restricted, and 20 positive. On a molecular way, uh, the immunoglobulin heavy chain and kappa light chain revealed patterns suspicious for monoclonal rearrangement. There was no clonal rearrangement involving the T cell, beta, and the gamma chains. So the diagnosis given by the Hodgkin lymphoma with in situ follicular lymphoma. Any question? Yeah. yeah, I have a question. So, uh, why is not a gray zone between classic Hodgkin's and DLBL? Because MUM1, I think the PAX5 was not weak positive, it was pretty of moderate. No, I, I actually deliberately showed that picture. I was uh, deliberately to distract, I put that picture of PAX5 where the big cell staining was the maximum. Majority of the big cells have very weak wishy-washy kind of staining. This is the only area. I took this picture from this area just to distract everyone. And I'm glad like you asked that question, why it is not a gray zone or why it is not a, um, like a hybrid B cell lymphoma, which is rich in T cells oh. in the background. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> deliberately, I just, because sometimes in a Hodgkin, a major, though the majority will so uh, this week are barely perceptible kind of positivity uh, and some foci we do see Pax5 being little more stronger and comparable to the background B cells. So we tend to call those as uh, these are B cell lymphomas. And here another thing is we have a CD20 positivity. The thing is these cells are 45 negative, though 45 negative B cell lymphoma is well documented. I also did a CD79A in this and a CD19, the both were negative. Okay, okay. Because I did have that question. Is it a Vishal? Pulkit, Pulkit only. Pulkit, Pulkit, yeah. Exactly the same question. I never thought of a Hodgkin in the first group. I was almost on the verge of signing this case as a Grey Jones lymphoma. I was not confident enough I, because at the more and more stain I was doing and I was like all over the place and this T cell aberrancy was coming into play. We had the... Uh, so a lot of things going on in this. 10 was negative and um, so that was the story but this is the only focus which has the maximum PAX5 strength in the entire slide so I deliberately put and this focus kind of took four days of mine to finalize the case I was sitting on the case every day before I finalized what to do Hodgkin okay. was the last in my prayer okay great uh, let's thank go to the next, next one So this is one thing I just want to let's say I post a few know that these are 
uh, Hodgkin and follicular lymphoma occurring in the same patient, providing some insight into the pathogenesis of the disease. Uh, the finding of CRD immunoglobulin genes in Hodgkin and follicular lymphoma in each in this case shows that they are derived from the same precursor B cell. Additionally, these two tumors contain common and exclusive VH gene somatic mutations, demonstrating that these precursor cells were of germinal center phenotype and these mutations are only introduced in the germinal center reaction. They also showed continuing somatic mutations within the immunoglobulin gene, that is, those are somatic rearrangement of the follicular lymphoma, which is typical, and it is likely that the precursor B cells in each case underwent a transforming event that was shared by both the tumors and when additional transforming events specific to each tumor subsequently occur. So let's go to the case two. Um, case two is, uh, I have to make up the history. I'm sorry, I really do not remember. It's a um, cervical lymph node that I remember and the patient is in, is a 50 or 60 year patient. So what we have here, um, there is perinatal extension of the disease. There is a thick capsule, and the lymph node is more or less completely effaced. So what we have, we have these blue areas with small nodules. There are some residual follicles, some hopefully, and we have these pale cells. And these are there are some areas which look like pseudo alveoli like pattern. Some areas the cells are packeting. They have prominent nucleolus. They are big cells. And they have intermediate to bigger cell cells, majority having prominent nucleolus. Some with some and most of the nucleus, uh, some are center and some are eccentric. Some are going to the nuclear membrane, attached to the nuclear membrane, vesicular chromatin. Some look a little mummified. Risk mitotic activity in apoptotic bodies. Cells with this packeting kind of arrangement is also seen. Some pseudo acinar pattern was also seen. So, when I work it up, I did a pan -sick. To begin with, it was negative. And I did not do a 45 in this case in the beginning. I did a for CD20 and a 3. 20 was negative and 3 has a very, very bystander uh, scattered T-cell pattern. Then I thought, let me do a 45. 45 was strongly positive. So, we have 45 positively. So, I know I'm dealing with a hematolymphoid neoplasm probably, but it's 20 and 3 negative. All my T-cell markers were negative. Pax 5 was wishy-washy and CD79A was very poor. I would say only 10% of the cells are strong. Those big cells were 79A positive. So I thought probably I'm dealing with her T-cell neoplasm. My 19 was negative, CD19. And it was a neck, neck area, the region. I had a wild thought of probably I'm dealing with a Merkel cell. I did a 20, CK20, which was negative. TDT was negative. Uh, regarding thinking about something, a granulocytic lymphoma, sorry, granulocytic sarcoma, MPO34 and 117, they're all negative. Peripheral blood sphere one film was negative. So what is the next step? How to work it up? I'll show you the stains. C38, 138. 138, 38. I did not do 138. I did 38, 30 was negative. Okay. 38 has, I mean, there are some plasma cells which were positive in between, like CD3, but it was largely negative. And ALK. Okay, great. You hit the point. I'll show you this is the ALK. This is CD30. Uh, this is 3. This is your 20. This is BCL2. I'll show you the best ALK here. This is your ALK. So what is the diagnosis? ALK positive DLBCL. Yes. This is the ALK positive DLBCL. I sent it out today. I took the pictures in a rush. So they are not that great. You know, okay type. Okay. And this is your KI67. So the third case, um, I will not probably go to the, for the third case in this. I'll go to the next one. Yeah. So it is a 41-year-old male with a swelling and ulceration in the ebola and soft palace. And this is my case slide. This is not from the same case, but similar case. So they look different. 
So this is the epithelium, the overlying epithelium. What you have, we have some pending necrosis, some neutrophils, and some nothing spectacular in this part. And here we have an infiltrate. What is more important with the infiltrate? More important to the infiltrate is this eosinophilic areas, which in between. I kind of give a lot of importance to this area because of maybe because of ulceration, there is some fibrin and a granulosa tissue formation but in, in addition to big cells which is kind of hiding within this infiltrate because it's composed of neutrophils as well and we have this vascular problem and same thing you have neutrophil nuclear dust and these cells some cells having some cytoplasm moderate some having little cytoplasm they're hyperchromatic these are endothelial cells the cells with the vesicular nuclei uh, I would say not vesicular they're kind of a smudgy nucleus and this big cell. And these are the normal ducts and they are kind of expanded. The stroma is expanded in between by this cell. They have a size of uh, about 1.5 times that of small mature lymphocyte. Nucleolus is not readily visible. Nuclear membrane is sort of irregular and they are happy. And some cells uh, focally, there are cells with vesicular nucleus, bromelian nuclear, and look at the nuclear envelope irregularities. And they are kind of surrounding these normal structures without involving them. Maybe one is going in, but majority are not involved. They are like kind of draping around it with prominent nucleoli and all. They are involving a vessel, a artery. This is from another case, not from the same case. So, any thought? LK cell lymphoma. Um, okay, that's a differential. Anything else? Diamorphic <coughs> sarcoma. Okay, anything else? Lymphomatoid granulomatosis. Yes, great. Anything else? So you want to work it up, right? Uh, do, do you guys think anything benign in this case? And honestly speaking, when I looked at the case, I could not see the mitosis that readily. It was not in a thinnest section also, mitosis were not readily disappeared. Is anything benign you think in this case? I mean, you all are in the differential, is it? That's a great differential. Vasculitis. Yeah, that's a possibility. Great. Let's see. So, this so is my... positive mucocutaneous uh, ulcer types. Cool, 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 cool. Great. So, my audience is really brilliant. I'm kind of learning a lot. I'm scared. So, this is your three. The bottom one is 3, the top one is B, 20 and 3. This is your CD2. So, sort of lost, very few 4 positive cells. 5 is intermediate, some positive, some negative. 7, uh, more or less, I mean less than 5, more than 4, where, the, uh, where less than 2 and 3. This is your 8, this is your 56, this is 57, which is negative, EBV, nuclear positivity. So I signed it out as a nasal type T and Kessel lymphoma. Am I correct, Kulkit? Yes, yes. What is the state of uh, CD30 and I need a cytotoxic TIA grandson? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll show you that picture. Yeah. Okay. CD30 was negative. Okay, just so just to rule out ALCL as these yes, can yes. be confused. Or like a CD30 positive lymphoproliferative neoplasm. You yes. mean to the lymphomatoid, carol, I mean, those spectrum bleeds. Yeah. 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 So, and I'll show you that. Uh, so, in this case, no, in this case, I'm sorry, I did not have the picture of TIA and Granage MB. I think TIA was positive and Granage MB, I have to check and get back to. These are old slides. So I have to like, but TIA was definitely positive. 
as I think. So the next sir, you asked us to think. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. You asked us no, no. to think something benign, sir. Um, any yeah. anything in particular you wanted to discuss, sir? Because the history is like it is in the Uvala and the soft palate. So I would kind of thinking people will ask me whether anything in the lungs or anything in the. the paranasal sinuses like vaginas kind of thing because you do see angiometers vasculitis and sometimes the epithelial histiocytes and the garden variety of histiocytes they do so a lot of atp as so i was getting get giving some hint like uh, i did not see any mitosis there was ulceration so you do always think about something benign i might present like this in sort of jumping directly into a malignant pathology okay So the next one, uh, next one is a 72 year old female, 72 year old female with an intraventricular mass. So it was a progressive. The patient had progressive hearing loss over the past decade and recently developed with pain in the left ear and the face. The patient had a history of migraine most of her adult life, and a facial examination and the facial muscle sensation symmetry. The hearing was intact to finger rub bilateral. MR revealed an enhancing mass measuring 2.6 cm in into 1.6 into 2.1 within the left lateral ventricular atrium compatible with intraventricular meningioma that was the thing the radiologist told me there was increased perfusion and blood volume within the mass i did not understand this intraventricular meningioma honestly i did not ask much And surrounding confronty to hyperintensity suggestive of asthenic. The patient underwent a craniotomy and tumor excision during the surgery. It was noted that tumor was rising up from the carotid plexus. And an intraoperative consultation was done, and debulbing was undertaken. So this is the lesion, the white area. There. This is what the intraop. So we can. Who can help me? With the intraop, any residents or fellows in the group? I mean, senior resident and residents. This is the intraop frozen section, right? So we have some. We have a monotonous blue cellular proliferation. That much I can see from this far. And this is the next part. What are these cells? Any resident or fellow? Sir, uh, lymphoproliferative neoplasm can, could be suspect some disorder. Okay, still so be. Look at these cells. Do they look? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it looks more like a non neural neural tumor. It doesn't look like neural. It looks something uh, different. And as you yes. said, it looks more lymphoproliferative. Okay, can you But be more specific? I don't think I don't see any glial background, sir. Fibrillary. Uh, glial oh, no glial or neuropil, nothing like that. And mm-hmm. if you see, yeah. there's no meningocardial differentiation, as the MR person said. How about the cells? Do you want to be a little more specific? Maybe favor something to the neurosurgeon while doing a frozen section. Mm-hmm. They're kind of eccentric, like right? the new care. Plasma cytoid, sir. Yeah, they look plasma cytoid. Very good. Let's see the next one. So the CD twenty was some of the cells are twenty positive. This was not my case. I inherited from someone, somebody else. So I don't have all the slides. I can give you all the information in this. This is three. Okay. This is one thirty-eight. Thirty-eight was also positive. And KI was 15%. There was kappa light gen loss, and majority of these plasma cytoid cells were positive for IgM and IgG, and few were immunoreactive for IgK. And in situ for EPA ish was negative. So I gave a diagnosis of primary CNS lymphoblastic lymphoma. I'm not I, my clay. So do you guys think is the correct diagnosis? I mean, I am nowhere. I cannot say it is correct or incorrect, but I just need um, help from the house. Is it a uh, lymphoblastic lymphoma? Sir, what is the HIV status of the patient, sir? I do not. I have to ask. I do not know the HIV status. Thank 
perform it. Have you performed MYD88? No, it was an old case, old case. Okay. It was, I guess, 2017, 16 or 17 case. Dr. Sridhar Patil on the YouTube website, can it be an angiosarcoma? Uh, what was the answer question? So, Dr. Sridhar Patil, he made uh -huh. a comment on your slide saying, can it be an angiosarcoma? On this one? On the CNS lymphoplasma sarcoma. Uh, okay. Um, 31 and 34 were not done. We didn't think about an angiosarcoma in this case. This is all the three positive, 20 negative. I mean, some are 20 negative, 20 positive. 138 was strong, and there was lambda positive kappa loss. So they are plasma cytoid. So why it is not a myeloma? Other than diffuse the large B lymphoma, lymphoma is manifesting primarily in the CNSR. They include low-grade B-cell and T-cell lymphomas. And primary CNS low-grade B-cell lymphomas almost exclusively affect the adults. They present with seizure, visual defect, focal neurological deficit, and or memory impairment. There is no association with immunodeficiency except in rare cases, extranodal, marginal joint lymphoma, or the malt. Primary CNS lymphoplasmistic lymphomas are even rarer. It is critical to confirm a neoplastic process, not a chronic inventory process. This is very important. So we need to, have to, to get into more and more detail. To separate the LPL from other low-grade B-cell lymphomas, including small lymphocytic lymphoma, mouse lymphoma, and follicular lymphoma, by its definition, LPL does not fulfill the criteria for any of these small B-cell lymphomas which are uh, given below that may have some degree of plasmastic differentiation. A small lymphocytic, mouse, follicular, they all can show some degree of plasmacytic differentiation because the distinction between LPL and these other lymphomas, especially the <coughs> malt concept lymphoma is not always clear, but some cases may need to be diagnosed as small B cell lymphoma with plasmacytic differentiation and a differential diagnosis provided in the There are no set guidelines for treatment. The treatment has varied widely and has included complete a partial resection, steroids, radiation, chemo and combination of this despite there is little evidence that adjuvant chemo and radiation will increase the chance of you know, I, I mean, uh, the, the result is not very promising. The treatment is basically aimed at controlling the disease process and prevention of the end organ and there is no known benefit to early treatment when the presence are asymptomatic or without end, in, end organ impairment. So you have, you have like lymphoma experts in our group, so I really need some opinion on this case. I put this case because I needed opinion. It can be that uh, extra osseous plasma cytoma, why, why it can't be plasma cytoma just? Exactly, that was my question. Why, for that reason I make this, why it is just not a plasma cytoma? So, why, why, I mean, um, it's I think uh, the only thing that can sort is uh, you can do mid 88 over the blocks and yes. Yeah, can we do have the blocks. That is going to help. Yeah, uh, that, that, that is going to help plus the uh, serum parameters as well. Uh, since uh, I think this has IgM type, so which... Uh, yeah. yeah, IgM type. Yeah, you, you can check the electrophoresis, uh, mm -hmm. serum electrophoresis for that thing and also the myeloma associated fish. Uh, recurrent genetic abnormalities. If they are present, they have in distinguishing LPL no, versus I myeloma. Uh, uh, yeah, I think there was a bone marrow following that. Okay. The bone marrow was negative. No, no, no. We, we can do, uh, you, you can do on this this section as Okay, well. you mean you mean the fish on the tissue paraffin block? Yeah, I mean. Def definitely. Uh, all the, it helps. Uh, it sometimes uh -huh. helps. Us it helps. You mean you're looking at the uh, uh, all the Translocation involving the immunoglobulin AV chain yes. and also yes. uh, 11, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14
it might yeah. be in the background t cells so many times in low grade lymphomas we do see a lot of three positivity in the background you know, t cells the cells which are positive they are all 138 positive and they are like plasma type you can you should get one mom one also positive i think you have done only one lineage of this 138 yeah, yeah mom one was positive mom one was positive so then, i don't have all the slides i didn't rush i took the picture okay okay But, uh, then, so my then, question is about this three is three positive is an aberrancy it can be an aberrancy right because three positivity is known i have few reports on three positivity in neoplastic plasma cells so i i have never seen So it was my question to the house: Can we get three positivity? If anybody has experience, I have no experience. I think three is three is a lineage marker. Other aberrancies are known, but not the three. Three, so, yeah, three is a lineage marker, and so lineage marker hardly they show aberrancies. So yeah. that is the thing. Yeah, you can also add the gene rearrangement IGH and TCR for the same. You're right. The block is there, so a lot can be done. Thank you, Bulkit, and thank you all of you. Okay, the next one. A 49-year-old female presented to the hospital with nausea and vomiting. CT scan of the abdomen demonstrated gastric and duodenal masses and retroperitoneal lymph node. Lymph node. She underwent a retroperitoneal lymph node, gastric body, and drum and duodenal biopsy. And this is easy. So we have a lymphoid infiltrate. They look fairly monomorphic. Uh, they have nucleolus, multiple nucleolus, big cells, monotonous, ugly nuclear membrane irregularities there. And this is another focus. This is another area in low power. Twenty few scattered cells at twenty positive. Three again. Some are three positive, but majority are three negative. This these are all forty five positive. MPO, those granulocytes with the residual present in the epithelium, they are positive, and some inside the vessels. Pax five was strong, nuclear, seventy nine year was positive, seventy nine year. Some cells are thirty four positive. Ki sixty seven is about seventy percent. Ten, every single cell is ten. Christmas tree, ninety nine is positive. TDD positive. So diagnosis. There is no phenotypic aberrancy. It was identified using the stains for five, seven, two, four, eight. Uh, the neutral trait was negative for B cell six, cyclin D one, mitoperoxidase, lysozyme one one seven and sixty eight. Peripheral blood and bone marrow negative for blast. What is the diagnosis? B L B L. And uh, it was negative for PCR level. Next one is the uh, male in late eighties with a left-sided neck mass. I'll probably skip this one. I'm not a cytologist, and these are all difficult cytology slides. It's, it's a woman in her eighties with a bowel obstruction, and presented two weeks of intermittent generalized abdominal pain. Symptoms worsened over forty hours. With no bowel movement, severe pain and nausea, vomiting, and patient admitted to the emergency department with abdominal distension and tenderness with obstructive, excuse me, obstructive symptoms. A CT scan uh, done at the month emergency showed a high-grade bowel obstruction secondary to a cecal mass, and the patient underwent an emergency ileocolic resection, and intraoperatively there was an interception at the ileocolic ileocecal valve. So this is. This is the mass. It's like a polyp. So it was a 5.5 centimeter rubbery tan polypoid mass in the ileocecal area, and the cut surfaces they appear to involve the submucosa. Yeah, this is the muscle here, so it is kind of expanding the submucosa. With displacement of the overlying mucosa, it has a fleshy look. The remaining of the terminal ileum, colon, and valve are grossly normal. So this is the mucosa, this is the muscular mucosae, and this is the lesion. It is kind of going through the muscular mucosae to the lamina propria as well. 
and it has a little mottled kind of appearance not very much mottled but we have nodules juxtaposed nodules of various sizes some pale areas and some dark lines going in between here uh, most of the cells they have nuclear membrane irregularities some with uh, smooth contour nuclei they're basically small cells little intermediate not big Any thought? What should be our lymphoma? What should be our first panel? CD twenty three, uh, twenty three five, socks eleven. You want to do everything in the first go? Uh, so generally, that is how um, we yeah, are we doing. Do it. What do you think about? We are living in this resource limited country. Uh, when the patient uh, have no money to afford the surgery or anything, and we are kind of pouring antibodies, so uh, you want to be a little judicious and spend like two days or three four days uh, to come to a diagnosis rather than putting everything in the first day and having issues. I would do a three a, a T and a B marker with a KI sixty seven and okay. a five and a twenty three to begin with. Okay, let's see. And let's go over the flow. The flow of this case was different. I mean, we have a kappa light and restricted B cell population, which are 19 positive, 5 positive, 23 negative, FM7 negative, and 20 with a moderate intensity, which is very important. And the T cell population is heterogeneous. And on, on um, IHC, there are 20 positive cells. There are scattered 3 bystander cells. 23 was rare positive. BCL2 positive, BCL6 negative, 10 negative, and KI is about 50%. So what is the next? I mean, I have the liberty to do all the stains, but most of the centers they do not have. I do, we do a lot of stains here. So, I mean, forget about me or where I work, the people coming, um, they have the money to uh, pay, but most of the places is difficult in our country. So what is the next marker? I think it's safe to go with a cyclin D1 or SOX11 now with a 10 negative and 23 this negative. This is cyclin D1. Scenario. This is your cyclin D1. So they are strongly positive for 20, 5 positive, 10 negative, BCL6 negative, 23 negative, FMC7 positive, 43 positive, BCL2 positive. Nearly all cases explain cyclin D1 and SOX11. So when you have 11 protein translocation with the rearrangement of CCNT1 and immunoglobulin heavy chain, uh, which can be detected by conventional cytogenetics, fish, or by southern blotting, or by PCR based technique to look for the transcript. And so this is something I just want to go over with all of you, not with the lymphoma experts. We'll keep you all like barred from this <laughs> discussion, so I'm just focusing for others. So the naive B cells they carry. 11 protein translocation. They colonize the mantle zone of the lymphoid polyp, which is just next to the terminal center, and they generate an in situ MCL lesion, that is, an in situ mantle cell lymphoma lesion. Most of the mantle cell lymphomas they evolve from these cells in the marginal zone with no or limited immunoglobulin heavy gene, V somatic rearrangements and SOX11 expression. The SOX11 overexpression in conventional mantle cell lymphoma may block the cells in a mature B cell stage, preventing their further differentiation through the SOX11, PAX5 and the lymph regulatory axis. Alternatively, some of the cells with the 11 protein may enter the germinal center and they undergo somatic hypermutation and they lack SOX11. So some of these mantle cells, they do have their negative they are negative, there can be SOX11 negative. So a classic mantle cell will go through a SOX11 positive unmuted cell, whereas with a B cell differentiation block, but the cases which are hypermutated and they can survive through the germinal center, so they become non rotor leukemic splenic and plasma blast like MCLs, and they are SOX11 negative.
Is it clear? Did I explain properly, Pulkit? Obviously, obviously. Yeah, only the uh, uh, straight point is when you have a asymptomatic leukocytosis and the flow turns out to be mantle cell lymphoma, then you think of this leukemic non-nodal mantle right. cell lymphoma and when there is a nodal involvement, then it's a nodal type with SOX11 positivity. Because the second one in the bottom is more of a flow cytometric disease. You got it in the... Yeah, it is just like a CLL thing. It's a CLL thing. And the top one is a nodal thing. So it is the bottom one is a non-nodal leukemic pattern of disease and otherwise it's more of a lymphoma type disease. So now coming to the next one is the um, area of women referred to the hospital because of acute um, deterioration of memory and orientation uh, with a weakness in the left leg. To develop severe neuropsychiatric deficit, auditory and visual hallucinations, past medical history was uneventful, MR was atypical, small number of patchy periventricular lesions, and small areas of abnormally increased T2 signal intensity in the temporal occipital region of the right hemisphere. Electroencephalograms would implement of the vigilance with subcortical disturbances, no stenosis of the cerebral vessels were evident by Doppler and Duplex. Cerebrospinal fluid evidence of breakdown in the integrity of the blood brain layer with elevated protein and slight pleocytosis. No skin changes. Uh, clinically, a viral encephalitis was suspected. The patient was hospitalized and developed thrombosis, died of massive pulmonary thrombosis. Atopsy revealed a slight edema of the cerebrum without macroscopically detectable foci. This is the brain. It, uh, what are these structures? This was from my thesis. Not This case is not from my thesis, but I saw this when I was doing my thesis, my dissertation during my MD. So what are these structures? In old days, you see this corpora amylase here, the polyglucose and bodies, they're present next to the PL blood vessels and the meningeal blood vessels just below it, below the meninges. And this is a vessel which is clogged with these B cells. These cells are positive for 3 20 KI yeah, is high. What are these structures? This is not from this case. Uh, this case had this thing, but this is from my thesis. Age old thesis from 1999. So what are these structures? Who can see these structures? This, this is the space of Walker Robin, and we have this vessel with some eosinophilic material. The old patient, and we have the star-like structures in the parenchyma, in the gray matter. These are amyloid plaques. And this is congophilic substance which is deposited next to the amyloid, next to the vessel. And these are all the beta amyloid state. So this patient had, and this patient also had amyloid-like materials around the thing. So it's an angiotropic lymphoma with cerebrovascular amyloidosis. So we found cerebrovascular beta amyloidosis is small parenchymal lead that might be contributed to the course of these patients while some other lymphomas such as myeloma uh, are known to be accompanied by pathologic production of amyloid not reported till date when we saw this case in DLBCL or angiotropic lymphomas. <laughs> Therefore, it is likely that the patient present lymphoma and the cerebrovascular amyloidosis are coincidental finding without a specific pathogenic connection. Given the elevated susceptibility of these vessels, which are more fragile and they, rupture, they, are, they tend to rupture, the presence of cerebral angiopathy, amyloid angiopathy in patients with angiotropic lymphoma could increase the incidence of parenchymal microblades and exacerbate and complicate the CNS manifestations of these patients. I'll do this. So this one, the last one I'll do. Then we'll finish the 60-year-old women with the multiple subcortical infarct. The white area, subcortical infarct in a 60-year-old woman. This is the infarct in the center. And this is the normal parenchyma. And this is another vessel. 
there is a lot of fibrin, there is a thrombus, and the wall as well as the lumen and the periphery that infiltrated by uninucleated hypochromatic cells. And if you see this, this is the sulcus and this is the pia and just below the pia the vessels are kind of clogged with these blue cells. Yeah, a lot of them. Irregular nuclear membrane, convolution, heterogeneity in their size, there's some small, some big. Twenty negative, P positive. These are positive for granozyme B and this is DIA. This is Iberish and the negative for 30, ALK1 and EMA. 8 positive, 5 and 7 positive with loss of 2 and 4. Um, K67 level dose cells and 56 was positive. 56 was positive, 57 was negative. So in an intravascular NKT cell lymphoma with associated multifocal migraine parts. So any question so far from the cases? Was blood picture available in the last case just to rule out aggressive NK cell leukemia? Yeah, the last case you mean this one, the NK T cells? Yes, yes, uh, yes. There was anemia. The patient was having microcytic hypochromic and low iron and all, but uh, WBC count and the platelet were normal. Okay. That's a great question because you were thinking like, is it like an aggressive phenotype of the disease and involving yes. the... Yeah, sometimes aggressive NK cell leukemia can involve the brain. Involve the brain. Yeah. So we can kind of uh, term it as an intravascular NK T cell lymphoma instead of writing like a leukemia, as you say, they are more aggressive and they have a systemic dissemination. Yes. I kind of pulled a lot of cases, but it's, very, it's kind of impossible to go over everything. And because there will be a lot of watch watch, then because we, we need to like un understand and do things that probably I'll do like eight or ten cases. Then maybe subsequently we can do more. Any question in the in the group in the WhatsApp group or sorry in the YouTube or in the YouTube there are two comments. One is I mean I am not very clear about the name so I will just read it out the comment. Plasma cell neoplasm can be CD three positive. It has been reported. Yeah, yeah it has been reported. That uh, I am discussing there are reports which are three positive but our question is because it is a uh, lineage associated marker a lineage marker or a lineage specific marker aberrance is rare in those markers so yeah. basically another, do not have comment, an yeah, another comment in the same in this particular case was what about the semic status uh, that I have to check I have, do not even know if they have done it or not the semic in that particular case okay Another thing I've forgotten to tell you, I didn't have a picture for that ALK positive DLBCL. Uh, that case was strongly semic positive. Almost 80% of the cells were semic positive. Aluminized mm -hmm. And we did uh, send the uh, tissue for BCL2, BCL6, and um, semic for the brick part studies. And semic was positive, and the rest two were negative. I mean the translocation. In all my uh, all our high grade B cell lymphomas, I do send it for B cell two, B cell six, and CMEC. If the patient can afford, I mean at least we write down in the bottom part of the report in the comment. 
yeah uh, dr sambath yeah i would like to know that you are performing flow in all such suspected cases of uh, lymphomas in tissue no uh, not all i mean we do triage the tissue uh, because we get the fresh lymph nodes when we get it so we have a team they call us and whenever they're doing a lymph node excision they call us so we go i mean my resident or my fellow usually go and get the thing um, uh, because we take the fresh tissue but whenever we need it or we have a question or uh, some cases the upfront bill it because in corporate setup is everything all about money <laughs> so the bill it then we go for a flow alam pa not in regarding the uh, regarding the igs and tc yeah uh, that in a very small subset that in a very small subset of cases not in all i mean okay, in, so in the us we not, yeah yeah and uh, in the us we used to do in almost all the cases flow um then um, tissue ihc and molecular they all are integrated and we i tried that it's always not possible i would say probably out of 100 cases 10 will turn out to be everything 10 10 may be more optimistic also it's like 5 to 10 cases will turn out to be everything but things at least nowadays it's kind of if you have a flow and everything uh, with you then you become you feel more confident signing out the cases of at least we release the report with uh, histology and the immunohistochemistry and we release another report as an addendum once we have other uh, findings available with us the molecular there is another comment which with the same uh, doctor says so mantle cell lymphoma in this case yeah that was a mantle cell very very nice cases eh? brilliant Sir, uh, one more query. Uh, another differential diagnosis in that L positive could have been HHV eight associated DLBCL. So, yes. have you in your practice uh, uh, those risk got such case? And no, I have never seen. I've only seen in uh, conferences and in the book. I've never seen in my practice HHV eight a positive DLBCL. What is your experience, Pulkit, on that? no we also haven't seen those such cases we tried hunting for those cases in such scenario mm-hmm. but we we didn't mm-hmm. had the alp positive dlbc and also the hlh mm-hmm. so the pretty rare conditions and just the describing so, I mean, books aha uh-huh. the, the alp positive dlbc so there is a subset which express in hlh right in alp yes. positive dlbc right yeah 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 and 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 what clone for uh, alp you use for this uh, you use the routine or uh, d5s well that thing no d5s but vendana we use the vendana okay okay thank you sir but that's a good point i mean we have the block and can do like this hsb i just send out like today aaj ko us report kiya maine i thought to take some pictures you can try <laughs> yeah <laughs> I can send you the block. You can do it. Just be it for me. <laughs> sure. Lymphoma is a huge topic, and I mean, there's so many cases, and a lot of like everything is becoming so and. So, so complex in every organ system, and lymphoma is the most complicated area. I feel the more and more you read, you are like lost. But the thing is, basic morphology is very important. I mean, the reactive lymph node. I did not put any reactive lymph node today. The reactive lymph node is the most common. I mean, the difficult area. And the second is uh, diagnosing something on a core biopsy, which is not uniform. If you have a uniform cell population in core biopsy, it is little easier. I would not say it is very very easy. But if you have a heterogeneous population in a core biopsy, it is like a nightmare. And giving a heroic diagnosis of lymphoma in a core biopsy is difficult. Where once we have a big lymph node, it's probably not a big deal. But when you have a core biopsy, it is difficult. What is the opinion on core biopsies, Pulkit? Are you very comfortable on core biopsies? Uh, 
Yeah, so sometimes when we have a straightforward uh, defining marker on our <coughs> core biopsy, we do give, but especially in cases of T cell lymphomas and yeah. all, or DD the between uh, reactive lymphadenitis versus a T cell lymphoma versus a T cell rich B cell lymphoma, we get stuck and uh, yeah, we, then we correlate and we discuss in the lymphoma rounds and then we ask Round, yeah. more samples. <laughs> Samples, yeah, because sometimes it's very difficult for the surgeon also to get a proper lymph node out because they're like stuck uh, next to a vessel. Or, so in that time, if you have a polymorphic lymphoma, specifically as Pulpit said, T cell rich B cell lymphoma, or you have a, any sort of a T cell lymphoma and reactive lymph node, sometimes the uh, this thing has gone through a follicular center, so you see all big cells, and you tend to do like CD30, the positive. You say like, oh, I'm dealing with a um, Hodgkin. Or I mean, or I, I you get some B cells and uh, you see very high Ki sixty seven. So those kind of things. So uh, I feel in a core biopsy when you do not have a uh, defining marker and the morphology is not very classical, you basically have to you know uh, have a consensus opinion um, in the department as well as with the, your clinical counterpart and look into uh, LDH does help in that case and how long the history is, what are the other sites of involvement, multiplicity of the lymph node involvement, multiple involvement, those things really help in those scenarios. But uh, core biopsies are like, we usually get the core biopsies, I mean excisions versus core rep, they're kind of half and half. Anybody uh, wants to give any like, other input on this because there's so many people in the group? Because like uh, percenters like PGI where we all are working is more like we have immuno setup because when there is no immuno setup what is your take home message will get if because you do a lot of cases of lymphoma i mean when you have no immuno setup i mean the immuno setup so is very very the, minimal, like three four stains suppose you have available because in the rest of the country i mean it's not like everywhere you have all the markers yeah, yeah, yeah. So initially, I, uh, I, I, we have our own sort of panel, you can say, because we also have resource constraints. We initially go with a CD3, CD20, and CD30 in all cases, irrespective right. of whether you are seeing the large cells or not, because we right, right. CD30 is really a good stain for the lymphoma for Hodgkin's, and then we do the second panel. And for the, uh, it's a golden thing if you have a core biopsy, you always ask for a further coated sections, unstained sections, so as to save right. the tissue. So rather that's, because these are the precious well. tissues. Right, that's a very good question. Suppose you have a lung core, breast core, lymph node core, and especially a lymph node core. Tell your technicians to have at least 10 unstained polylysin coated slide ready for you when they are trimming the tissue. Because at the, if they're going to cut it the next day, they're going to trim and lose a lot of tissue. So you need Definitely. like 11 sections up front, one for H &E, and the rest they keep it uh, expecting an immuno workout. And definitely, and don't hesitate to ask for uh, an opinion from your colleague. Exactly. Yeah, definitely, yeah. rather than wasting a tissue on some. Uh -huh. yeah. So I said knock stain and telephone stain. What is knock stain? You knock the colleague's, your friend's door and say, hey, can you help me with this case? That's the best thing. And number two, if you, both of you or three of you cannot reach to a conclusion, have a telephone stain. Call your clinical counterpart and ask for help. Asking for help in pathology is a credit. It is not a discredit. Definitely, and and especially you should also be very somewhat familiar with the PET scan reporting because your yes. SUV SUV uptake helps sometimes because especially yes. in a reactive versus a high grade thing. Reactive and, versus uh, low grade versus high grade because reactive and low grade they have a similar SUV max, but high grade you usually have a high yeah. and what is the contour of the lesion and all. So PET if it is available, it is very very important. Definitely. Unlike the other solid organ malignancies where you can get away without knowing the radiology to some extent, lymphoma is more of a clinical imaging and pathology diagnosis. I just want to emphasize that at the end of my talk, it's, uh, it's, uh, you need to know the clinical very well for lymphoma. Yeah. Very interesting discussion. I think we have to close here. Thank you. And, yeah, very nice. Uh, very, very interesting cases. Very, very, very nice discussion. Lot of doubts cleared. Lot of uh, new things, you know, learned. And we have a very nice panel. And I can see some of the 
people who will be coming in to talk. Dr. Pulkit has a talk on the differential diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma, the spe specifically the RS cell, next month. And we oh, great, have great. Dr. Manasi also in the panel. Neeraj Dameja is also there to be speaking soon. So mm -hmm. we've got a lot of people here who would be talking. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, everybody, for joining on the YouTube. We've got a big team there listening to us. Thank you so much. Dr. Sambit, once again, thank you for coming onto this platform thank you, and sharing your excellent uh, knowledge on these subjects. Thank you, Dr. Pulke, Dr. Shilpi, Dr. Manasi, Dr. Rajiv Shukla. Hey, Dr. Rajiv is there. Yeah, he was He was just trying to knock you. Can I say hi to him? Hi, Rajiv. Oh. Hi, Sambit. I was there. Hi, Rajiv. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm going to call you. I am good. As soon as long time, as soon as the uh, talk is, uh, I'm going to call you. Yes, yeah. I just want to tell the audience that I passed my MD exam listening to Sambit. So oh, he used don't to tell. Please, please, please. please. <laughs> <laughs> and no, no. And I, I always say I passed my exam because of Rajiv Shukla. Everyone knows in in US and yeah. in India. Everyone know I got my MD. My I owe my MD degree to you, Rajiv. Because I was Come like extremely on. lazy. You read and I was to sleep and listen to that. <laughs> good, right. good, good. Nice to speak to you later. Okay, uh, cool. Hi, uh, Dr. Rajiv. How are you? <laughs> good, good, sir. Uh, how are you? I'm fine. Yes. We are trying to defend ourselves from the second wave of COVID. You know, just trying to I work know. ourselves. There's so many people. I know the restricted yeah. the mobility, right? You cannot move. Yeah. We also have Dr. Mm. Harveen Gulati here, Dr. Kirti Gupta, Mr. O, Dr. O.P. Gaming, and so many of them. Thank you so much for joining. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.